Welcome back to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry. Here's your host, Brother Robert Johnson. All right, welcome back to the show. This is episode 283, and I just got over a cold, and I think I should probably give you guys the Masonic secret to getting over a cold is, are you ready? It's uh, you eat a crate of cuties, or the little tangerines, and drink Dunkin' Donuts coffee for three days. That's it. That's the miracle cure. Of course, I'm just kidding. Uh, Just getting over a cold, so pin orders were a little bit delayed in getting shipped out, so I do apologize for that, but you should be getting them just in the next couple days. I went ahead and I mailed them all out uh, just the other day. So, if you've been waiting a while for a pin, I do apologize. In the news, there was a bit of a delay in the podcast episode coming out last week. YouTube listeners and those who just stream it from Facebook actually listen to the show just fine, but the iTunes portion didn't update regularly as it was supposed to, so we had to go in and manually refresh, and then uh, it popped up right away. So do apologize for that as well. One of the things I did want to mention was that um, Brother Levi Banker, owner of the Banker's Best website, where you can get the King Solomon's Reserve, both Beard Oil and Beard Balm, Uh, asked me to let you guys know that he was made aware of an issue with his website's login, and he has since fixed the problem. So if any brethren out there have tried to order in the last week and weren't able to, the problem is fixed now. So please head on over to buybankersbest.com. Anything you purchase there, go ahead and use that promo code BBWCY357, and you'll get 20% off. The Levi Banker has been incredibly generous in helping support this program, so we thank him very much for his efforts, and thank you guys for being producers of the program. Now, in this episode this week, we have a couple really amazing things to cover. Uh, Number one, illustrious brother Stephen L. Harrison has a great Masonic Minute. And we're going to continue the Masonic 10 for 10. That's 10 questions, 10 worshipful masters. And this week we've got worshipful brother Jason Richards from Acacia Lodge, number 16 in Clifton, Virginia. So without any delays, let's get right into the episode with this week's first piece. So I wanted to keep the piece short for this week because of the awesome content we've got with the 10 for 10 questions i'd like to just go ahead and get started on the piece which is a little something i put together for the midnight freemasons it's called freemasonry is worth more than and we'll get started freemasonry is worth more than by midnight freemason contributor right worshipful brother robert h johnson i find it Kind of just funny here in the beginning to note that I started the blog post off with the Dwight meme from The Office, and it says, False. The dues aren't even close to high enough. I'll continue the piece. Often while swiping through the conversations on Facebook and social media regarding Freemasonry, there are numerous threads talking about lodge dues. Too high, too low. When we advocate for higher dues, the argument is that we're pricing good men out of the craft. When we price too low, we argue that the craft will surely die. Arguments for both sides are many. Some argue that dues should remain low and that a lodge should offset costs by holding fundraisers. Others say that the public shouldn't flip the bill for an organization's existence. Others still maintain that the cost to join has been kept the same over the years, which is why the big temples closed. While the cost of everything around us increased, the dues stayed the same. Those who advocate for higher dues structures will point out that Freemasonry doesn't cost that much. In many cases, the yearly dues are less expensive than the monthly cost of a service a brother indulges in. Recently, a brother posted something interesting on Facebook. He said, quote, Add up all your dues, divide by 365 to determine the cost of masonry per day. Post your results below! Exclamation point. Tons of people did this. I decided to take the data and determine the average. Out of 50 random responses I chose, the average man pays for membership in total for all the bodies he belongs to, not just Blue Lodge Masonry, in a cost of about $1.12 per day. The highest amount a man paid per day was $5.38 per day, while the lowest was a mere $0.10 per day. Compare these numbers with the average services or indulgences we pay for today. NFL Sunday Ticket $269 per year, or 73 cents a day. Cable and whole, $1,188 per year, or $3.25 per day. 
Starbucks, $1,300 per year. That's five days a week, $5 per day. Tobacco, $2,321 a year, or $6.36 per day. Netflix, $100 per year, or $0.27 per day. Hulu, $96 per year, $0.26 per day. Microsoft Office, $84 per year, or $0.23 a day. Alcohol, $548 per year, or $1.50 per day. This is from a 2011 survey, which I have adjusted for the Consumer Pricing Index. I should also note here that several brothers made note that they felt the number for alcohol was grossly underestimated. Fast food, $2,619 per year, or $7.17 per day. This is, again, according to a 2011 survey. Lottery tickets, $52 a year, $0.14 cents per day. That's one ticket each week. Or a gym membership, $360 per year, or $0.99 cents a day. Now compare this to Freemasonry, $408.80 per year, or $1.12 per day given the average we talked about above. So I think this is an interesting and solid way to look at things. The fraternity surely needs the funds. There is a lot to pay for. Meals per capita, buildings, maintenance, etc. Look at the gym membership numbers alone. To quote worshipful brother Scott Duball, shouldn't we at least value spiritual and mental health as much as our physical? Surely Freemasonry is worth more than all of the things we listed above, isn't it? In fact, I'd say it's worth more than all of those things combined. When you say that Freemasonry isn't worth $100 or more a year, you're directly saying that you value any one of those things listed above, or anything else you want to figure out the values for, more than Freemasonry. It's hard to see the value in Netflix or Hulu when you don't turn on the TV. And the same could be said for not attending Lodge. Perhaps it might be time to reevaluate things. So, that is the end of that piece. I hope you found it interesting and perhaps something that you might want to read in your lodge when you guys are out there trying to advocate for raising the dues. Many dues around the nation I have heard are as low as $25 a year and I just cannot contemplate how that works. Again, I'm not from some of the small towns where this happens, um, so I'm sure you guys have reasons, but there is one underlying fact is that, you know, that $25 you need to adjust that for inflation at the very least. So look at the last time you raised those dues and adjust for inflation and see what it costs today. See what your lodge should be charging today. If your lodge has been around since 1850 and if your dues were $3 a year in 1850, well, in 2016 dollars, I, I do know this is 2017, but in 2016, that's $88.19. That's just inflation. That means the buying power of $3.1850 has the same buying power of $88 in 2016. So you need to at least understand that, and your lodge membership should as well. I am a Christian. That's none of your business, mind you. But it probably is pertinent to any slant I might put on what I'm about to say. And apparently... The jury is still out on my belief system anyway. Why? Well, I've been personally told I'm not really a Christian because of the denomination I belong to. And we've all heard this one. You can't be a Christian because you're a Freemason. I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank anyone who has ever told me those things for clarifying to me what I think and believe. There was a time in my life when I thought that was between God and me, but I'm so grateful you have set me straight. Sarcasm aside, some Christians, it seems, want me to have a personal relationship with Christ, but get really upset when I keep it personal. Having said all that, let me drop the bombshell. Freemasonry is not a Christian organization. When the cries of heathen die down in response to that, I'll continue to say there are many hearing this who would think, well that's so obvious I don't even know why he would say it. The rest of you are the ones shouting heathen. 
What a fine paradox. Some think we can't be Christians if we are Freemasons, and some think Freemasonry should promote Christianity. Without dropping some dry statistics, let me just acknowledge I live in an area which is predominantly Christian. Many even included in the so-called Bible Belt. So being a part of an organization that requires a belief in God and living where I do, it's not much of a surprise to see many of my brothers emphasize the Christian influences in our fraternity, not just in our ritual, but also our activities. How many times have you been to a lodge dinner when someone wraps up a prayer in the name of Christ? This happens so often in my area that back when I edited the Missouri Freemason magazine, two former Grand Masters, one a Christian minister, one Jewish, along with an eminent right worshipful brother, asked me to reprint a Masonic Service Association short talk bulletin about its inappropriateness. The gist of the article was, stop praying Christian prayers in our lodges. It embarrasses and perhaps even humiliates our brethren of other faiths. The same, I might add, is true for the publications I edit. No discussion or promotion of religion. And if you're sitting there thinking, he just said we shouldn't talk about religion, but that's exactly what he's doing here. Respectfully, you missed the point. That point being Freemasonry not only includes Christianity, but also other religions. Those among us who have a hard time with that should heed this observation from one of our most famous brothers, Samuel Clemens, especially when sitting in lodge. So much blood has been shed by the church, he wrote, because of this omission from the gospel. Ye shall be indifferent as to what your neighbor's religion is, not merely tolerant of it, but indifferent to it. Divinity is claimed for many religions, but no religion is great enough or divine enough to add that new law to its code. For the Whence Came You podcast, this is Steve Harrison with the Masonic Minute. All right. Thanks very much to Brother Stephen L. Harrison for his excellent segment. Let's get right into this week's main piece. Masonic 10 for 10, this week's Worshipful Master, Brother Jason Richards. And as a reminder before we begin, Brother Jason Richards' positions are his own and do not reflect any positions or statements of the Grand Lodge of Virginia or any other grand body. Again, they are his own. I urge the listener to understand that these are his own experiences and what he talks about is through his lens. So this is, for the record, 10 for 10. Please state your name, lodge number, and under whose jurisdiction you fall. Thanks, Robert. My name is Jason Richards. I am the Worshipful Master of Acacia Lodge number 16 in Clifton, Virginia, under the jurisdiction of the most Worshipful Grand Lodge, Ancient Free and Accepted Masons of Virginia. Awesome. So the way I'm doing these is it's 10 questions, and I'm not offering too much of a conversation piece. I just want to ask the questions, get your take on these things, and keep moving. Does that work for you? Sure. All right. So, again, these questions can be weird. Some of them might be silly. Some of them are objective. Some of them are subjective to you, and you might need to think about it. And if you need me to kind of explain what I'm asking, I can do that also. So, the first question is, why are you the Worshipful Master this year? Well, you've got a couple different ways that I could answer that question. Uh, In Virginia, uh, a lot of times the progressive line is king, so... One could say that I didn't screw up enough in all of my previous years of service as an officer to warrant getting kicked out of line, and that is why I am the Worshipful Master this year. But I think it'd be disingenuous to stop there. I'm Worshipful Master this year because I see the potential of my lodge. I I see where we are. I see where I want us to be. 
and I've worked out a plan on how to make steps to get there. Uh, I, a big focus of my year is creating small sustainable changes because if you go into to the lodge, you know, your term is, is very, very often in Virginia, at least limited to one year. And there, if you go in and make a bunch of sweeping changes, there's no guarantee that any of those changes are actually going to stick, especially if you make people uncomfortable. Yeah, that's so true. I've seen me, that. I wanted to just take a, a couple little things here and there and, and do my part to, to make the lodge better. And for, for me, that's really trying to um, increase the lodge's visibility in the community. So I'm, I'm worshipful master because I see the potential of my lodge. I see how wonderful it is. And I see a couple ways that I can work really hard to, to make it a little bit better. Fair enough. Uh, next question is, what's your lodge's biggest strength? And you can answer that any way you want to. I'm not looking for a specific thing you do or something you're great at, however you're looking at it. My lodge's biggest strength, that, that's an easy question, actually. It's the atmosphere. It is what keeps me coming back to Acacia every single week. The brethren that make it up are some of the friendliest, most genuine people you'll ever meet, even in the craft. And it is such a welcoming, down-home uh, family environment that I really have yet to see at least on the same level um, with any of the lodges I've ever visited. Acacia has something really special, and I'm very proud of that. Yeah, I can kind of attest to that a, a bit. I mean, I only visited your lodge once, and I was in love with it from the, the second you guys opened. I mean, it was, uh, it's intimate, it's nice, it's got history. It's pretty It's pretty awesome. So You walk into the door, and people are genuinely glad to see you. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, that's not something you get very often. Yeah, I totally agree with that. It was awesome. So the next two questions are kind of similar but what do you want to change about Freemasonry I want to strip out all the ego 99% of the problems that we're dealing with in the craft are directly attributed to ego unwillingness of Grand Lodge, Grand Lodge leaders to do what works to increase retention offshoots and organizations that are struggling to survive that we simply can't let go that are placing a burden on the craft brethren who are walking into lodge rooms and walking out not ever coming back again because they're not getting a warm and welcome reception it all comes down to ego and masonry is the last place where an ego should take precedence yeah i mean not to go off on a tangent i'm just gonna drop this and walk away but i mean we're supposed to not have egos it's supposed to masonry is supposed to cure that <laughs> well it's it's like the the meme that's out there it says uh you know freemasons are all on the level that's why we have so many of them exactly and i think that's that's just such a a poignant indictment of the lack of equality in this fraternity i would agree next question this one might be kind of fun to answer and I understand, so I, like you, am involved in, I essentially work for Grand Lodge to a capacity. But if you're Grandmaster for a day, let's change that. If you're Grandmaster for a month, what edict do you enact? Ooh, that's a fun one. That's something I'm going to have to think about here for a couple minutes. That's fine. I'll wait. <laughs> So I've got a functional one right off the top of my head, um, but it's probably not the the playful sentiment that you're looking for. So I can always uh, brainstorm another one after I give you the functional one. <laughs> no, you know, um, you take this how you want. If you want to be silly, you'd be silly. But if you want, if you want to give us something awesome, then give us something awesome. For me, I mean, you, you and I have known each other a while, and you know, even based on my my previous answers to some of the questions, equality is huge for me it's it's very very important um that we start living our ideals saying well you know worshipful master in the east is the same as the youngest entered apprentice in the northeast corner uh, but that does never happen and one of the places where i see the most equality uh, or the most inequality rather 
is in our relationship with our Prince Hall brethren. So an edict that I would enact immediately after taking the Grand East would be blanket recognition of all Prince Hall jurisdictions that are recognized by their Grand Lodge counterparts. Sweet. Washington, D.C. style. Nice. Um, because we owe it to ourselves not to wait for them to ask for recognition from us because, frankly, most of them don't care. But we owe it to ourselves because of the history and, frankly, because of why Prince Hall Masonry exists in the first place, which is white men refusing to give black men the charter. We owe it to ourselves to start repairing those bonds. Agreed. All right. Beer in the Lodge building. Yes or no? Why, if you want to? So at the time Jason took this deep breath, which was followed by a 10 second pause before he started to answer, I had no idea where we would end up by the end of this question. But it's important to realize again here that these are the thoughts of his own personal experiences. And it made me wonder, how many of our brethren have experienced something similar? But let's listen in to see what he says. That's a difficult question to answer. <laughs> <clears throat> and here's why. Um, I, I make it no secret that I'm not a Shriner. Uh, and I, I'm a minority in my lodge because my lodge is 99% Shriners. And one of the main reasons why I'm not a Shriner is because I've gone to Shriner functions. And I see the Shriners who haven't been in Blue Lodge inside of a decade. And I don't like most of the Shriners I meet. They drink too much. They're crass. They objectify women. And these are just the behaviors that I have witnessed at Shrine events. And I think there's no place for any of that in Masonry. Now, I have a beer pretty much every time I do the Masonic Roundtable. I don't think alcohol in and of itself is the problem. I think instead it's the atmosphere and the connotation of the organization that somehow makes it okay to cut loose and forget your obligations. And I think that that really has its basis in the, the tagline, the shrine is where Masons go to have fun. Uh, because I have a ton of fun in Acacia. And I love my brothers at Acacia. Because to me, fun is enjoying your time with your brothers. And I, and I can do that actually at the bar after lodge. I, I do that all the time. Sure. Um, but we don't go there to objectify women. We don't go there to get drunk and make crass statements. And... At the Shrine events I've been to, that's what happens. Now, that's a really roundabout way of saying, look, it, it really depends. For me, I think beer in the lodge building is just fine as long as your junior warden lives up to his duties and he guards against intemperance and excess. Sure. What inspires you to keep doing this? And this is a, is a big statement, and that is you're active – you produce content and you're on the web. So what inspires you to keep doing it? I'm stubborn. Simple as that. I started my blog, The Two Foot Ruler, because the Grand Lodge passed something that I absolutely hated. And I was stubborn enough to say, look, this, this isn't okay. And I became a uh, member of the Grand Lodge Committee on Public Relations because I saw some things happening and I said, look, if we don't get some grounded individuals in here, what's gonna come out of this isn't going to be okay. So I stay active so that, for, for lack of a better term, uh, I stay active to make sure that I delay stupidity from occurring. <laughs> and I mean, you know, it's it's kind of tongue in cheek, but sure. really I'm I'm here to provide a voice of reason and a fresh perspective and to try to influence the craft where I can to make it better. And I'm very passionate about that and I'm very stubborn when it comes to bettering the craft. And that's why I stay as active as I do. Next question. You're stubborn. You've been stubborn for 40 years. 40 years in Freemasonry, 
Where have you been? What groups have you led? What have you done? Have you joined dependent bodies? What have you accomplished or hope to have accomplished? For me, it's never been about the bodies I've joined. I'm only a member of three. Sure. Uh, to include Blue Lodge. And, you know, I'll, I'll eventually get around to the others. But honestly, you know, when it comes to Scottish Rite, like I'm not, I'm not chasing any hats. Um, I don't really care about titles or accolades. Uh, like I said, you know, I'm, I'm a committee man on the Grand Lodge um, because I was stubborn enough uh, to, to put my money where my mouth was because I was talking to another committee man who said, hey, you're really passionate about this. I tell you what, why don't you help us write this policy? And I said, absolutely. <laughs> right. So for me, it's it's not about the, the accolades or the titles. For me, I'd love to see myself 40 years down the line where masonry is in enough of a spot where I can detach and just take it easy and have fun. And that'll be the case if I can inspire and mentor the next generation of Masonic leaders. So for me, it's it's not about the different organizations you know rituals are cool and fun but at the same time once you get outside of the blue lodge i hate to tell you but it's kind of just words uh i've never been really really super inspired by by ritual in and of itself even though the blue lodge degrees were great so that kind of leads into my next question sovereign grand commander northern jurisdiction in lexington john mcnaughton recently had a uh, piece out there and at the end of it he said he was in the piece uh, mentioning how this importance on ritual weighs really heavy on the craft and that it needs to be ritual charity fellowship kind of a 33 split and at the end of the piece it says remember or something like uh, to quote so and so ritual is what we say masonry is what we do within that and we kind of touched on this for those who are listening to this, and Jason sounds familiar to you, he is uh, Jason Richards of the Masonic Roundtable. Episode 153, we talked about the initiation into manhood, essentially. And we talked a little bit about ritual. Uh, what is the goal of Masonic ritual in your eyes? Masonic ritual is the door, the gateway, if you will, to the initiatic experience, which I believe is the true secret of Freemasonry. And what Jason Richards is about to say here rang true for me personally after seeing so much subpar ritual. And what he says is something I think we all feel, especially when we see this stuff happen in our own lodges. So, you have to have good ritual. You have to have spectacular ritual. Otherwise, you are cheapening another brother's initiatic experience. Now, there's a difference between ritual and education, and that is where I will differ greatly from the Sovereign Grand Commander, because ritual is not education. Right. You can parrot back ritual words. You know, we do a mouth-to-ear catechism, uh, which is which is great. It it helps people learn the ritual, but it's the mentorship and and the, um, the pairing of a mentor to the candidate and explaining what is happening in the ritual as the candidate is memorizing it, where the education really comes in. And that's only one small sliver of Masonic education. So I, I disagree um, terribly with, with the idea that Freemasonry really should be 33, 33, 33, you know, ritual, charity, and fellowship. I personally think that uh, masonry should be I'm going to like listen to this on once came you and be like oh said so many boneheaded things <laughs> I really think that masonry should be 65 education 35 fellowship because I would lump ritual in with ed yeah. with education sure. but ed ritual would be like a 15% part of that education pie because we're we are here to better ourselves we better ourselves by growing connections and networking and fellowshipping and by increasing our own knowledge and our own learning and our own worldviews and that's where education comes in now it's interesting i didn't leave anything for charity if we're good men 
and Masons, charity is a natural offshoot of what we do. We should be doing that anyway, which is why I think it's stupid to mandate charity as a part of Masonry because it's something we all should be doing. Fair enough. Kind of a fun question. You could uh, catch some flack for this one. You get to erase one Freemason in history. Who is it? Why? Andrew Hammer. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm completely kidding. <laughs> he got you, Andy. He got you. <laughs> oh, I love you, Andy. Um, this question was born out of reading the Masonic Black Sheep that came out of uh, a Masonic blog, which I don't really want to mention because it says on there I'm not supposed to do that, so I won't. But, uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's so many guys out there that I've thought of in the past. You know, there's guys who've gotten in trouble. George Ryan, one of our previous governors here in Illinois. Uh, yeah, I mean, you think of the, the big ones like um, Leo Taxel, uh because he was a Mason. He did at least have his EA degree. Yeah. Um, but the fact of the matter is there there's a certain sanctity to life. And so I, I struggle with the question erasing someone completely from history. Because I, I think to answer that question would be disingenuous and, and a little bit unmasonic. There are, there are plenty of actions I wish I could erase from history. Like... You know, in last night's uh, Masonic Roundtable show, we talked about the 70 year old uh, former grandmaster from UGLE who got caught in a child sex sting. I, I wish I could erase that action, not sure. only for, for the, the dramatic impact like it's had on, you know, whoever knows how many victims, but just the the fact that it's so antithetical to who we are as Masons and, and what we're about. So I would say there are plenty of actions I would love to erase, uh, but not necessarily people themselves. Okay. Now our last question is actually uh, given to us by a by the previous worshipful master who we interviewed. So, so this question comes from Brother Scott Duball, who's worshipful master of DC Craigier Lodge here in Wheeling, Illinois, and we were having a nice breakfast. And I asked him, I said, what's your question? Why didn't you take me out to breakfast? Well, you know, you're over in Virginia. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So I asked him, I said, what's your question for the next master? I said, and I'll give you a little bit of a a push here in that it's Jason Richards from the Masonic Roundtable. So here's what his question was. And Scott, I apologize. This is not going to be verbatim. So his question is, at the beginning of each year, you kind of set goals and expectations for yourself and you define what will make you have a successful year in your lodge. What will make that successful year? And he alluded to the fact that at the end of a year, uh, you can look back and you kind of make maybe not excuses, but you make some uh, justifications of why you didn't get XYZ done, but yet still define it as a success. Uh, Scott comes from a place where he's actually serving a two-year term. Um, We have to get elected every year, but they've agreed that everyone wants to go two years because they're in a phase of building. So part of me thinks he he may have just gone through this where, you know, he's getting installed his second year and he's looking back at the previous year saying, what did I do that I wanted to get done that didn't get done? And why am I still calling it a success? Kind of an honesty moment. So for you, What is a successful year? And then is there room for justifications at the end of the year? And you still call it a successful year. Mm. So that's, it's something I've, I've struggled with because I am very much a, a critic of of myself in particular. Um, I've already, you know, I'm, I'm three months into my year. So I'm actually a quarter of the way done, which is kind of scary. Yeah. But I'm looking back at, at what I've done so far, and I've already said, well, you know, I haven't gotten that done yet. Oh, I'm struggling in that area. Oh, I'm struggling with this. So for me, I haven't given a lot of thought to what will inherently make my year be a success. I guess it would be, you know, in lines with the introduction I gave in, in my first trestle board where I said, look, you know, my, my theme for the year is perfecting the Ashler. 
and the idea that we need to grab a hold of masonry as a, a sanctification process and we need to chip away at that rough ashlar by focusing on things that make us better men and better masons education our relations with prince hall uh, our stance and our activism in the community those are three of the big things that i that i pointed to the other was uh taking care of our our physical building so those are the four things that I put on the table as big focus areas, at least for me, under the lens of sanctification and, and self-betterment. So for me, if I'm able to touch on those four areas and make small, albeit sustainable changes, then I would call my year a success. So with education already, um, I'm actually having two to three educational programs every single lodge meeting. That's I have great. a big open program during dinner that's open to anybody, Masons and non-Masons alike. And then we go upstairs for the tiled portion. My lodge education officer gives a five to seven minute program on a topic of his choosing. And then when we have official visits by district officers, they give a, another educational program. And that's a way that I can get the brethren thinking about things they normally wouldn't be thinking about in a way that doesn't infringe upon their time because you know nobody likes to sit in a two-hour business meeting and that's, Tell me that's about just it. the way it goes um, people are are ready to get done with business and head over to the bar I get it but before we get there we're gonna learn something new so for, for education, I would see that as a success. If I can look back on, on the year and have folks in the lodge say, you know what, I remember that one program and that was really cool. Or maybe even just having next year's Worshipful Master, um, presumably my senior warden, probably will be, he's doing a great job so far. Uh, and maybe if Joe, my senior warden, when he becomes Worshipful Master says, hey, Lodge education officer doing a small program every single meeting was a great idea. Let's keep that. That's a small, sustainable way to, to get education back into the lodge. I would see things like that as a success. You know, taking care of our building, I've, I've enacted a budget uh, where we are dumping most all of our cash into the building fund to take care of the building because we just renovated, but at the same time, we've got a lot of stuff that's breaking and in need of repair. So if I can set the next master up to make some hard decisions on what we will and won't fix with the building and give him the cash to do that, then that's another way that I would see success. With Prince Hall, I'd, I'd like us to start visiting and having Prince Hall members visit our lodge because it's so, so important that we work together. So next month, I'm bringing in the Associate Grand Historian of the Most Worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of D.C., uh, Brother James Morgan from the Prince Hall Think Tank. Really, really great friend and brother. And he's going to come and give a program on Prince Hall Masonry during the Civil War and the Reconstruction Era. And I'm inviting members of Prince Hall Lodges to come and fellowship with us um, to say, hey, you know what, you guys are welcome to come and spend time with us at Acacia whenever you'd like because we are we have recognition we have visitation it shouldn't be this big grand lodge hoopla of well if your ddgm says it's okay and my ddgm says it's okay no <laughs> show up just be there have your dues card ready and enjoy it yeah. Um, yeah so and the other and the other thing and i know i've rambled on long i apologize um but not really no, <laughs> is uh you know community activism and community engagement and you know, Acacia's big charity, as it were, well, is its community, the community of Clifton, Virginia. And that's a, that is such an important piece of who Acacia is. But at the same time, we only get out in the community maybe twice a, twice a year. So what I'm trying to do is, is trying to figure out how we can increase our, our own standing in the community, increase, increase our own visibility. And by way of doing that, cement our relationship with the community a little bit more than it already is. And if I can look at one or two things that, that we did this year that we didn't do last year, even as much as getting community leaders together, talking with the lodge members, that's going to be a big win and that's going to pay dividends down the road. And so if I can you know, bite off a small chunk of each of those four areas, then I think I'm comfortable calling my lodge a success. 
but I do think that there's wiggle room to to justify because you're not going to be able to get everything done that you want to do. Things are going to come up. You're going to get distracted. You're going to get roadblocked. You're going to have uh, things that are outside of your control that are going to inhibit you from doing what you want to do. And in some cases, some very, very rare cases, the worshipful master might change his mind about what he wants to do. And that's okay. And I would, I would dare say that any master who comes in and gives it his very best, it's impossible for him not to have a successful year. Because the only way to be unsuccessful as worshipful master is to not give a shit. All right, that's it. That's cool. your 10 questions. So everybody, that's Jason Richards. You can find him uh, on the Masonic Roundtable every Tuesday, ten nine Central. When he feels about writing on something, the two foot ruler and Midnight Freemasons. Midnight Freemasons honestly takes precedence. <laughs> True story. They get a solid one to two articles a year. I hope you enjoyed. And there you have it: ten questions with the Worshipful Master of Acacia Lodge Number Sixteen, Brother Jason Richards. Next week we'll have another ten for ten. And you'll have to tune in next week to see who that is and what state they will be from. But until then, I just want to remind you all to please head on over to WCYpodcast.com and hover over the Support the Show link. You can click Buy a Pin, which will take you to a link where you can buy a pin. You can get cufflinks. You can get our tie bars or money clips. Those uh, other options aside from the pins are actually limited quantity. So you're going to want to make sure that if you want those... You pick up those before anything else. Um, You can click the Where to Shop link, which will take you to a few really great places in order to do some shopping. You can use a promo code. And as long as you click through our links there and use our promo code, this show gets a small percentage of the sale. It doesn't cost you a penny more than it normally would if you had gone to those websites. It's just some great partnerships that we've been able to work out in order to fund this program. So we've got Onnit Labs. You can use promo code WCY at checkout for 10% off. And, of course, buybankersbest.com, where you can use the promo code BBWCY357 at checkout for 20% off. Um, You can also check out some of the other things there. We have a link to direct donation, where you can just make a straight contribution to the show, which is always appreciated. And please make sure to check out the donor wall. Uh, So if you click on that link, you'll see a picture. If you click on the picture, it'll make it a little bit bigger, and you can see the names of the people who have done extraordinary things for this show in the realm of of production these people have single-handedly produced several episodes of the show and we greatly appreciate it this is of course listener supported education again if you haven't been to our website in a while we did do a new update so it's a little bit different of a look and i hope you guys like it it should be a really seamless experience there for you one thing also to note is the 300 years of freemasonry celebration so if you can go on wcypodcast.com and click 300 years of freemasonry celebration it'll take you to the masonic roundtable.com slash 300 what is this um, again, I have talked about it the last few weeks, uh, and I'm going to keep on talking about it. So essentially what we have here is there is no great 300-year celebration happening here in the in the United States other than a couple other events that, uh, quite frankly, have been put together, in my opinion, a little bit last minute. UCLA is doing a great thing. Uh, they're doing a 300 years of Freemasonry in addition to... The Philolathes Society is doing something. But nobody's doing anything where just anybody can come. So any Freemasons that would like to go to what could be the coolest and most interesting conference you'll ever go to in your Masonic career can come on out to this event. 300 Freemasonry's Legacy, Freemasonry's Future, also deemed TMRCon. Uh, So June 23rd, which is a Friday, we're going to have early arrivals and registration. We'll have some Masonic tours of D.C. and the surrounding area. Those will be determined as we get closer to the date. We'll have a dinner at about 7 p.m. located at a local restaurant. It'll be by your own. We'll try to keep that within the the realm of cost-effective for everybody so we're not, you know, going to price anybody out of dinner. And then... Also, June 24th, which is a Saturday, that is the main event. So we rented out the George Washington Masonic National Memorial. Yeah, it's kind of a big deal. So uh, (laughs) June 24th, again, that's the Saturday. We're going to have some notable Masonic speakers, including Brother Stephen L. Harrison. Uh, We're going to have some trivia games, Masonic vendors. There's going to be tons of fellowship like you've never had before and much more. And we'll be able to announce 
even more as we get closer to the event, specifically probably by the end of next week, we'll be able to announce a lot more uh, as what's coming up. So please stay tuned for that for any updates. We'll push out to our Facebook page and on Twitter. And of course, follow the Masonic Roundtable. If you would like to get your tickets now, which I really suggest, you can hop on over there to the website and pick them up now. The tickets will increase in price as we get closer to the event this is done through eventbrite so unlike a kickstarter campaign this happens no matter what anybody who buys a ticket this will happen we've already solidified everything so you will not be disappointed again we'll have more details about what's going to be happening at this event uh, probably toward the end of next week what you can imagine is some masonic presentations but more than anything you are going to be the presenters individually almost because We're going to be working through and talking to each other about where we've been and where we're going. And it won't be anything without you guys. So we need you to come out. We are excited to spend this 300th anniversary of UGLE with you at the George Washington Masonic National Memorial. So I urge you all to come out and check that out, please. And TMR, right? So You can go to themasonicroundtable.com. This is a show that we also do, and it goes live on YouTube every single Tuesday at 10, 9 central. We've had some great topics the last few weeks, and we're only going to get better. So if you enjoy Masonic Podcasts, and I know you do because you're listening to this program, please head on over to the Masonic Roundtable, whether you get it on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever. It's a great show. We have a lot of fun. Again, 10, 9 central every Tuesday. If you'd like to get a hold of me for any reason, you can hit me up at admin at wcypodcast.com. And if you want to get a hold of anybody else at our show, including Adam Thayer or Bill Hosler or anybody else, you can also do that just by going to wcypodcast.com. And you can click on About and go down to the WCY team. And you can find hot links to all your favorite fellows over there and send them an email if you'd like. Get in contact with any one of us. So with that... I will bid you all adieu. Until next week, stay on the level. For Whence Came You, I'm Robert Johnson. You've been listening to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry with your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Be sure to join us for our next edition.